Good morning. We welcome you to our Easter service. So glad to celebrate the greatest day in all the world, in all Christianity, with us today and with you today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We celebrate that every day as we live individually in the power of the Holy Spirit, but we also celebrate it every Lord's Day as we come together. But this day is set aside as we honor that great day and remember that great day the Lord burst forth from the grave, came alive, and is alive forevermore. So we want to to celebrate it. You sing along as Brother Toby sings in a few moments. You open the, your Bibles and join in as we open God's Word. And we're going to have a great time together today. Let's pray together, thanking God for the privilege of being alive in Christ. Our Father, it is a joy to celebrate this day, to celebrate it together with fellow believers, to know that it's the day that solidified your Lordship, that proved who you were. You live, were born of the Virgin, showing your deity. You lived a sinless life. You willingly went to a cross. You were placed in a tomb, but yet on early Sunday morning, you showed the world, you showed every demon in hell and the devil himself that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And then you lived and walked on the earth 40 days. Today you're seated at the right hand of God, soon coming. Thank you that you're living in the heart of every believer. As we come to this service today, may the reality of your life, the reality of your resurrection, the reality of the resurrection power of Christ will be lived out in us. May we never fail to praise you for your death on the cross that paid for our sin, for your being raised from the dead that gives us power over our sin. Bless the music. Bless me as I preach. May we become absolutely insignificant and get out of the way. May you be high lifted up and may everything point to you, never about us, so that especially this day when folks see this service, view at this time together, they'll not remember who sang or who preached, but they'll remember Jesus. For he's who it's all about. For we pray it in your name. Amen. Now join us as we worship. Amen. Good morning. It is all about him. Let's lift up his name today. Let's praise him. Oh, such a joy to be in the sun today and worship the S O in Jesus Christ because of who he is, what he's done, what he's doing even right now, and what he's going to do. Come on, help me sing. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, you and you alone are worthy of our praise. We just lift your name up, that all men, women, boys, and girls will be drawn unto you. Lord, I lift you came. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. 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 Amen. It's Brother Clark.
Clark shares, we've got good news for you today. Just want to remind you, Jesus lives. If you know this old hymn, we hope pray that you'll sing along with us. I'm so glad we serve a living and risen Savior. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. If he lives within your heart, let's sing this together. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him. The help of all who Another is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me. our one and only true source of hope. And if we ever needed that before today, we need it right now. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. How 
out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Oh, Jesus, yours is the victory. have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Amen. We praise you. Amen. Don't we have much to celebrate? Our living Lord, our risen King. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul answers the question of, of the resurrection. Evidently, it was much like what was going on in 1 Thessalonians to the Thessalonican church, that there were those who had come into the Thessalonican church and had told the Thessalonican believers they had missed the rapture. Well, here... Evidently, there were some false prophets that had entered in that had told the Corinthian believers that there was no resurrection of the dead. So now the Apostle Paul is showing that because Jesus was raised, it proves that we will be raised. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, chapter 15, notice what he says. He says, Moreover, brethren, he's writing to believers, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received and wherein you stand, by which you also are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part uh, remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, and am need to, uh, uh, not even meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And then he goes on and shares his testimony, and he talks about... Uh, uh, those that have fallen asleep in Christ. And notice what he says in verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for Jesus and for grace. We do pray that you continue to bless the remainder of this time together. Bless the word. 
The Word is what draws people to you. The Word is what makes a difference in lives. So you bless your Word, and we'll thank you for it. Empower me and anoint me. Give me that fresh oil that I may be able to share what you want me to share. Cleanse me. Cleanse my heart that from all sin and self-centeredness and areas of my life that are, are not where they ought to be and make me usable for you so that you can be lifted up and be glorified. And for those that hear that they, those that are lost will be saved and those that are saved will grow in Christ as we celebrate this day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to take just the, a few moments and share with you on the subject the importance of the resurrection. Three quick truths about the, the importance of it. The, the resurrection is what sets us apart from all the religions of the world. His virgin birth is important. It shows His deity. His sinless life is important because it shows His deity. His willing death on the cross, substitution, sacrificial death is so important. But He had predicted for those three and a half years many times with His disciples that even though I would die, that he would be raised from the dead, that he would come out of the grave. The Old Testament prophesied how that Jesus would come out of the grave and he wouldn't stay in the grave. Not only did he prophesy his death, it prophesied his resurrection, it prophesied his ascension to heaven, it prophesied, and Jesus himself did that. So if he was not raised from the dead, he was either a liar or he was a lunatic. But I want to tell you, his resurrection proved that he was Lord. And so I want to share that with you. First of all, in verses 1 through 4, I want you to notice the prominence of the resurrection. It shows its prominence in the preaching of the gospel. It's amazing that every time you, you read after the resurrection, one of the apostles is preaching a sermon that they're sharing or a message that they're giving, the resurrection is the central part of it because the resurrection is the central part of the gospel. That's why I notice what Paul said in verses 1 and 2. The prominence of the resurrection is it's the focal point of the reference to salvation. He says, I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you by which you're saved. What does he tell us in Romans 10, 9? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There is no salvation outside of the resurrection. Our salvation is absolutely dependent upon the resurrection because only a living Lord. Why is it essential to not only confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus to have repentance, but to believe in our heart God raised Him from the dead because only a living Lord, only a living King could, could live in us. You see, we not only needed a Savior that would forgive us for our sin and pay for our sin, we needed a Lord that could help us overcome our sin. My problem is not that I just need my sin paid for. My problem is that I still have flesh in my life and I still have to deal with that flesh. And the only way that I can win that battle with the flesh is a living Lord through the person of the Holy Spirit living in me. And so we have to believe it is essential to the gospel. If you're saved, you believed in a living Lord. If you've given your heart to Christ, you have believed in your heart that God did what He said He would do. Jesus was raised from the dead. He's alive and He's alive today in you. It is an essential focal point in the reference to salvation. And then in verse 3 and 4, it is the focal point in reference to the Scriptures. Notice what He said, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried that he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. It's always the Scriptures that bear witness. It's amazing from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The Word of God teaches the resurrection of our Lord, points to Jesus. R.G. Lee, the great pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church, in yesteryear said it this way. He said, wherever you ever turn to in the Scripture, you start there and make a beeline to the cross because every verse of Scripture is a scarlet thread pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to His death for our sin. It's pointing to His death in, in, in the grave that, that showed His literal death. That's why Paul made it clear. He was buried. You don't bury somebody that's alive. And then it points to His resurrection that we have a living Lord and, a, and an eternal King. What a way to re recognize that. The resurrection is so important because we can't be saved without it. The resurrection is so important because it is the central theme of the Scriptures. We know He died because of the Scriptures. We know that He was raised because of the Scriptures. We sure have a lot of proofs that are, we're going to see in a moment. 
But I want to tell you the, the preeminence and the prominence of the resurrection in the preaching is so important. And in the scriptures, it's so important to see because without the resurrection, you don't have a Bible. How many of the verses of the, of the Gospels deal with what goes on after the crucifixion? What goes on after the resurrection? You've got chapter after chapter in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got Paul's testimony three times in the, just recorded in the book of Acts. And it deals with what his life was and how a resurrected Lord changed his life. We're going to see his testimony even here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The whole crux of Scripture, the whole crux of salvation has to deal with the resurrection of our Lord. And so first of all, the resurrection is important because of its prominence in the Scriptures and its prominence in salvation. But also it is important by the proofs that are given of the resurrection. I want you to notice here he gives six of the 12 appearances. The Bible records 12 resurrection appearances from Mary there in the garden all the way till the disciples are there with him when he's ascended up into the, to glory. We find six of them mentioned here. God inspires Paul to write six of them here to give us the proofs. There's Josephus, the Jewish historian that was not a believer that alludes to and talks about how the, the talk of a resurrected Lord, the talk of, a, of the Messiah that coming out of the grave had changed Jerusalem in his day. There are those who, who uh, the history of so many non-Christians that were alive in that day that talk about it. The 500 that he talks about here, there are more proofs of Jesus' resurrection than there are that George Washington was president, the first president of America. There's, there's more proof that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the history of Christianity, the changed lives of the disciples, those who were meek and scared and ran off when Jesus was taken from the Garden of Gethsemane, gone to court and false trials, placed on the cross. The only one finally came back was John. The rest of them were gone in hiding. Jesus, after the resurrection, had to find them in the upper room, scared to death. And there Thomas wasn't even there and didn't even believe. There were doubters. There were those who had, who had cursed and sworn and said they didn't know him. There were those who went back to their old lives of fishing. And yet when they saw the living Lord, they were changed forever. They were willing to not only serve him, but die for him. Many folks, some folk, may die for a lie. But everybody would die that knows it and understands it would die for the truth because the truth is what uh, they died for. They didn't understand about Jesus. But I want to tell you, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they saw the living Lord. They walked with Him and ate with Him. They were willing to die for Him. And that truth set them free. So notice what he tells us here. The six times that he, he shares that were, he, he revealed Himself. He says, first of all, in verse 5, the first proof is that he was seen to Peter. You say, well, Peter would have said that. He was one of his disciples. This was on Easter morning. This was on Resurrection Day. We know that Peter ran to the tomb, and there he saw the Lord Jesus. Then it says he was seen to 500. Now, many of these 500, we don't know if all of them were saved. We don't know how many were saved. But we know this, that, that there he was, seen of the 12, that he came to the upper room the night of his resurrection, and he showed himself the Bible, here he records it to 12, but it was 10. Judas had hanged himself. Thomas wasn't there. Jesus showed himself. They were in fear. The doors were closed. And he came in and he, he showed himself to them. And, and when they were so excited, finally Thomas, when they saw him, said, We saw the Lord. And he said, Oh, no, unless I touch where his, the nail prints in his hand and thrust my hand in his side, I'll not believe. And the next week, Jesus, the next Lord's Day, as they were celebrating again, they were together again, Jesus showed up and showed Thomas the nail prints in his hand and said, thrust your hand in my side. And Thomas made a great statement, my Lord and my God. And history records, church history, that Thomas was willing to die for the Lord as a martyr. Here he was doubting. Here he was didn't believe. And yet the resurrection changed his life. So he tells us that he was seen of Cephas. He says he was seen of the 12. I just shared with you about that. He was seen of the 500 at one time. We don't know how many of those were saved. And then Paul says some have died, but there are many. If you want to know you Corinthian believers, you can go find some of those 500 that at one time he, they were gathered together and Jesus showed up and, and, and they can give you a testimony that he's alive. 
He says, and now he, did, he was shown, showed himself to James. That's the brother, the half-brother of Jesus, James. He became the leader in the early church. John chapter 7 tells us that Jude, nor James, nor, nor the other brother of Jesus, nor the sisters of Jesus even believed in him while he was on the earth. Isn't it amazing that he could live without his parents never having to discipline him? He could live a, a perfect life in front of his brothers and his sisters. He could live a sinless life and be the model child and they didn't believe in him. He could live, do all the miracles and they didn't believe in him, but something happened when Jesus was raised from the dead, he revealed himself to James. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, they had the same mom, but different dads. James' dad was Joseph. Jesus' dad was God. And because they were half-brothers and raised together after the resurrection, James came to know Christ and became a leader in the early church. Either James led Jude to Christ or Jesus showed himself to Jude because even both of those, the half-brothers of Jesus, wrote books in our New Testament. What a testimony to our living Lord. How it changed their lives. He was seen of James, then of the apostles. That's when he came back again and the week after he had shown himself to them without Thomas. And then he says, and last of all, he was seen of also of me, one born out of due time. The proofs of the resurrection. The first proof would be the appearances of Christ to the 500, to the disciples. The appearances of what God did and how he showed himself. Twelve different occasions to be alive. And then the actions of Paul. Notice his past life in verse 9. He said, I per persecuted the church. You can go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. How it says he was a blasphemer. How it says he persecuted. How it says all that he did, but how God changed his life. You see, here was Paul on the Damascus Road going to arrest believers. He saw the living Lord. The living Lord talked with him. The living Lord came into his heart. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he gave his heart to the Lord and he went from a persecutor to a praiser, from a blasphemer to a blesser, from a persecutor to a preacher and he was willing to die and go to jail and be beaten outside of town and be shipwrecked and be persecuted by the church, by those inside and by those outside and to do all that he went through. A man that persecuted had his heart changed in one encounter with Jesus Christ. What evidence of the resurrection. You can go through all the disciples. Eleven of them gave it were martyrs. John was the only one that wasn't. Even Matthias, the one that they chose to take Judas's place, was martyred for the cause of Christ. John, the elder beloved disciple, was the only one that lived and died a natural death. All the others were willing to die. Peter on a cross upside down, some cut in half, some burnt to death, some pulled apart by ropes and chains. Some had their heads sewed all, uh, cut off. I mean, from one to the other, they were martyred for the cause of Christ. And yet they weren't willing to live for him until the resurrection. And then they were willing to die for him. What actions proved their, the resurrection? But not only his past life. Notice what he says about his present life. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm laboring more abundantly, more than any of them. I'm not even worthy to be called a disciple, he says. I'm the least of them. I'm not even worthy to be called a disciple. But now because I recognize what I was and I recognize what's going on, my present life is I'm serving by His grace. Paul said, I realize I got a debt to pay because I was headed for hell. I was headed the wrong way. I was serving the wrong God. I was serving a false God. I was serving myself and I met Jesus. He came to me when I couldn't get to Him and I saw that He was alive and a risen Lord changed my life and now I'm serving. I owe a debt that I could never pay and He lived His life serving the Lord with fervor, with faith, with power, with dying to self and being willing to do whatever it took to promote Christ because he had seen the living Lord. And then notice his preaching. He says in verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, we preach and you believed. The preaching of the gospel is what changed his life. You see, the resurrection is important because of his prominence in the preaching, because of his prominence in salvation because of His preeminence and prominence in the Scriptures. It's important 
because of the proofs that are given, the proofs of the 12 appearances of Christ that are listed in the Scripture, the, the actions and the changed lives of all those that met Jesus and were different after the resurrection. But notice the purposes of the resurrection. He begins now to talk about if there be no resurrection. Listen to what he said. He says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Evidently, some false teachers had come into the church in Corinth and they were either preaching, they were either ministering, or they had just come through passing, or they were constantly in the church and they were bringing a false doctrine. They came in, in as an angel of light saying, I'm a minister and I'm this, and yet they were bringing false doctrine into the church. They weren't even saved. They were denying the resurrection, and they said, oh, no, there is no resurrection of the dead. There is none of that. It, it hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. There are false prophets everywhere. They're in every church. There are false teachers that Satan puts in every one, and just like they were there in the church in Corinth. And notice what he says, And if Christ be not risen from the dead then is our preaching vain, meaningless, and your faith also is vain. The three different words for vain are I'm going to share with you. That in verse 14, it literally means there's no proof of it. Then your preaching is meaningless. There's no reason. There's no foundation for it. If Christ is not risen from the dead, we don't have a foundation for our faith. If Christ is not risen from the dead, he begins to, to now share why. The, what would happen if there is no resurrection? So here's what he says. The first purpose of the resurrection is for the vindication of Christ. Notice what it says. If there is no resurrection, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain, and we're found false witnesses. First of all, what he says is Christ is not raised in verse 16. And if Christ is not raised then he's not who he says he is. Jesus said that he would be raised. Jesus said that he was Lord. Jesus said before Abraham was I am. Jesus said I and my father are one. Jesus said if you've seen me you've seen the father. You remember in John 14 where Thomas said may we see the father and Jesus said have I been with you this long and you don't realize when you've seen me, heard me, watched me, you've seen, heard and watched the father that I, I and my father are one. Either Jesus was truthful and honest and king or Jesus was mixed up. Some in that day thought he was lunatic. He was crazy. He, was, he, he said before Abraham was. Jesus was thousands of years after Abraham. But yet he said before Abraham was I am. How could he say that? Because he created Abraham. He was on the throne. He was seated right next to God. Before the world was, Jesus was. He's always been. And, be, and the, the resurrection validates that. The resurrection vindicates Christ. The resurrection shows the world, hey, you can go to the tomb of Muhammad and find his bones. You can go to the tomb of Confucius and find his bones. You can go to the, these other tombs and you can find their prophets and their leaders buried there, but you can go to the tomb in Israel right out of Jerusalem. And I want to tell you, Jesus is not there. His bones are not there. His dirt from his body is not there. He's raised. He's alive. He's Lord and the resurrection proves His Lordship because only a Lord could be raised from the dead to never die again. Jesus raised three from the dead when He was on the earth, but they died again. There were others that were raised from all through the Scriptures, but they died again. But Jesus was raised to never die again. It's a vindication of Christ. It's a validation of our preaching. He says, yeah, if Christ is not risen, our preaching is, has no foundation. It's in vain. No need in preaching it. We're found false witnesses. You see, all these preachers for 2,000 years, the disciples, Paul, those from the early church, even to today, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, we have lied to you. We have preached a false doctrine to you. We have preached to you that we have a hope at death. We have preached to you that, that your loved ones are in heaven. We have preached to you that you'll see them again. We have preached to you that, it's, that because Jesus has, has conquered death, we're going to conquer death. And I want to tell you, if Jesus is not raised, if he had, is not the resurrection and the life, we've been false preachers. And we're not false preachers because not only do we know it by the Scriptures, not only do we know it by history, we know it by the, like the Apostle Paul said, we've seen him with our spiritual eyes. We've heard him with our spiritual ears. We know he lives because he lives within our heart. 
and because we've experienced Him and experience Him every day. It's the, it's the vindication of Christ. The resurrection is important because it's the validation of our preaching because it gives us our victory in our life. He says, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. And then listen to what he says, you are yet in your sins. You know why the resurrection is so important? Because we're not in our sins. See, we would still have no power over sin. We would still be living carnal life. We would have no help to live the godly life. Christianity is not just praying a prayer. It is God's life in us. That's why we can live above sin. That's why we can be victorious over sin. That's why he wrote in 1 John chapter 2, These things write out unto you that you sin not, that we don't have to sin. We don't have to live our lives in the flesh. We have hope and help, and that is a living Lord in us. One of the great purposes of the resurrection is not just heaven. It is here and now to be victorious. He says you're, you're in your sin. And then the second thing he, it is is victory over death. He says they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. You see, if Jesus isn't raised, then your loved one's bodies are still in the grave. Their soul is there. There's no hope to see them again. There's no need in going to the cemetery. There's no need in coming to church. But because of the resurrection, we have victory over death. Because He is alive, we're, we can be alive. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. What a great truth and promise that is. And then it gives victory in our everyday life. Paul says, if in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. What he means by that is simply this. If, if we can't li are living our lives knowing that, that from one problem to another problem to another problem, we don't have help, we're of all men most miserable. So what are the purposes? It vindicates Christ. It validates our preaching. It gives victory in our life, but it, it gives verification of our hope. Let me close by reminding you the great, one of the great truths of the resurrection. Paul says, he says, every man shall be made alive. He said, for as in Adam all die, even so as in Christ shall all be made alive. Did you know you and I are going to be made alive one day in Christ? He says, first of all, every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. The reason he used that is because the, the, in that day they would plant wheat or they would plant barley and they would go out and if they would have a good good first fruits and, and gather some early, they would know the harvest was going to be great. And it was a promise that there was going to be a great harvest. Jesus' resurrection is a promise that there's going to be a great harvest. And so what he tells us here is, he shows us about his confession that Jesus died. He's the first fruits, every man in his order. And then it says, afterward, those that are Christ, it is coming. He tells us not only his his confession here about Christ being delivered, about Christ coming out of the grave, about Christ being made alive, and about all of us being made alive. But then he says, after Christ, at His coming, we're going to be raised. See, one of the greatest days that is ahead of us is the rapture of the church. Here he's writing to the church. He's reminding us, and he explains it in the last six to eight verses in 1 Corinthians 15 that he's going to show us a, a mystery that we shall not all die, but we shall all be raised in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trump. Hallelujah. Because he's alive, he can come again. Because he's alive, he's coming again. Because he's alive, we look forward to the rapture, our soon coming Lord. And he says that He will resurrect us. He will make us alive one of these days when He comes again. He says, and then comes the end when He shall deliver the kingdom to Himself. There's going to be the resurrection of Christ, the rapture of the church, the coming of the Lord when He comes to set up His kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Because He's alive, because of His resurrection, because of his soon coming return, hallelujah. We wouldn't have a heaven to look forward to. We wouldn't have a kingdom to spend eternity in if it were not for the resurrection. The resurrection is so important. It is vital to our faith. It's vital because, number one, it is, 
important in the preaching of the Word. It is so important in the Scriptures. It is important because the Bible gives us the proof, so many proofs of the resurrection. And it is important because it, its purposes are to show that Jesus is Lord, to show that we have hope, to show that He's coming again. But you see, the facts of the resurrection don't mean anything unless you have experienced the resurrection power of Christ in your life. You do that by receiving Jesus. You say, well, I don't know if the resurrection is true. You may not, but I'll tell you if you'll come to know Him, if you'll give your life to Him, if you'll be like the Apostle Paul and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? You can know the resurrection is real because He won't be a God that's in heaven that's far away. He'll be a life that's in you that lives out the life of Christ in you. If you don't know Him, call on Him. If you don't know Him, admit you're a sinner and ask Him to save you. If you don't know Him, believe that God raised Him from the dead. Turn from your sin and receive Him into your heart so that you may be saved. And for those of us that are saved, may the soon promise of the soon coming return of Christ, may the validation that we're going to live forever, ever, May the preaching of the gospel and the changed lives of the disciples and what God's done in all history show us and remind us of the great resurrection of our Lord. Hallelujah, what a day. Thank God for our living Savior. Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus, the proofs, the prominence of the resurrection in the preaching and in the scriptures and the purpose of the resurrection to show the Lordship of Christ, to give us victory every day in our lives, to validate our preaching that we've been preaching day by day by day for 2,000 years, and then to, to remind us of the victory we have and the hope that Jesus is coming again. Thank you that we look forward to that day and for that soon return of our Lord. If there are those listening that don't know you, may they come to know you. And for those who are listening uh, that are saved, may this solidify to them the great privilege we have and the importance of our living Lord. And may He live out His resurrection life in us. And we'll thank You for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you and God loves you. Have a great day.